the 21st century, I'm going to walk around with it tonight. Only a few of us here. Anyway. <laughs> the literal of the 21st century are not those that cannot read or write, but those that cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And here lies the biblical text that we've read to you in your hearing, Acts chapter number 1. Acts is a very peculiar book. It's a book that's very different. It talks about trials. It talks about tests. It talks about tribulation. It talks about issues and circumstances. It gives us a glimpse of what you really have to go through when you get saved or connected with God. We have developed this happy-go-lucky mentality of salvation today. And when you get saved and there's no recompense, there's nothing you have to go through, there's no, there's no uh, issues or circumstances that you have to have, you just get saved and everything is just supposed to change overnight. But when you look at the book of Acts, you will find that they had to literally sacrifice things, mm -hmm. sacrifice their lives. Uh, You'll find that eventually Paul was, had to face the horrors of Nero's chopping block just because of the sake of the gospel, the kingdom of God. Uh, it was a professor at our school that had mentioned one time in my spiritual formation class, he said, that it is not just any gospel. It's not just any gospel, but it's a gospel that is powerful, that is strong, that when you look at it and you see it and you understand the power of sacrifice, that God could sacrifice his own son for the redemption of humankind is something that we should never take lightly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just want to talk to you tonight. I preach all weekends. So I'm just going to talk tonight. I don't have much voice left. I'm just going to talk tonight. <laughs> I don't preach the Lord. You can find that online. Uh, and, 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 but when you look at sacrifice, you look at all the things that they had to go through, you will find that Luke began in the book of Luke, the gospel according to Luke, uh, he begins to describe to Theophilus. Theophilus means, in the Greek word, uh, friend of God. It, 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 some scholars argue and say that it was a person, and then there's some that say it's just to every believer. Either way, you've got to read it because it's the word of God. And what you'll find is, when you look at this, you will notice that he begins to show him how the disciples had sat under the tutelage of Jesus, for three and a half years, and they've seen him raise the dead, and they've seen him heal blind eyes, and they've seen him do all of these great and mighty things. And now we have a crisis. We have a crisis because Jesus specifically tells the disciples that I'm going to die. I'm going to hang myself. I'm going to hang on the cross, but yet in three days I'm going to raise myself back up. He said that to them to prepare them for what was going to take place. But what's interesting is, is that the very thing he told them he was going to do, they still did not believe he was going to do it. Mm -hmm. right. Follow me. So we have a crisis because the death of Jesus Christ has come. The death of the man who had sat around for three and a half years and showed them what to do, how to do, and was preparing and positioning them for something greater than himself. And so now all of a sudden a crisis has come because the very man that they looked up to has been Kid, but they forgot the rest of what he had said. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's right. Luke then gives us this understanding, he gives us this uh, perspective on what we should expect as believers. That there will be times of crisis in our lives. Amen. Mm -hmm. There will be times of critical moments in which we have to literally ask ourselves the question: Why is this happening to me? Yes. Mm. Can I go a bit deeper? Notice what happens. Now you have a crisis because the death of Jesus Christ has come. The death of the leader, the death of the teacher, the death of the master. Come on in. The death has come. And so now he's hanging on the cross and he has died. But then Luke now presents us a change. First thing we have is a crisis. The second thing we have is a change. Somebody say change. 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 We all should know what some sort of what change is by the 2008 election. You, you mm -hmm. see Barack Obama talk about change. He, he was selling and branding himself as hope, as change. And so people are getting riled up and ready because they wanted change. But with every change, there's a crisis. Amen. Every crisis has a change. That's right. Every change has a crisis. Luke exhibits this so, so clearly because of the beloved position. He shows us how you have this crisis. And then with the resurrection is a change. Mm -hmm. And now we're transitioning ourselves into Pentecost and comes an opportunity. So, notice 
the text. It says, to him he presented himself alive after suffering by many infallible proofs. Mark would give us an understanding as an unmistakable proof. In other words, what he was really saying is, it's something that you cannot deny. Mm -hmm. He has done these things. And we notice now he says, after being seen of them, he spoke to them pertaining to the kingdom of God. The word kingdom comes from two words, king's domain. It is the authority, the rule of God in the earth. When we pray, Jesus instructed the disciples clearly with Matthew. He said, when you pray, that you pray thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Which means that the believer's life is not just to be excited to escape the horrors and pitfalls of the earth. Jesus did not die that we just die and go to heaven. But he died not only for us to enable that same power, but to bring it and transform the society in which we live. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's right. There are seven different sectors of how a society runs. I don't have time to go through all this tonight. There are seven different kingdoms, seven different systems that control a society. Number one is religion. Number two is education. The third is government. Number four is media. Number five is family. Number six is entertainment and arts. And number seven is business. Seven different systems to how a society operates. Whenever you control any society, the first thing you do is get the media's attention to reshape the landscape of what's being said. Mm -hmm. That's why whenever you look in the scriptures, whenever you look in the book of Acts, you will find that every time the apostles had to handle a situation or a crisis, the enemy was decisive on how exactly he should attack. Acts chapter 17 tells us that they established their own base. Which means that the people that got angry at the apostles had come together and went to Jason's house, but they gathered together before they went. Mm. The body of Christ has missed that point today because we'd rather go out on our own and do our own thing rather than consulting and trying to get other people with us together to attack the enemy when he's more divisive and together than we are. Amen. Amen. Say something. Oh, so now, we have this opportunity moment. Because we see now he begins to speak to them pertaining to the kingdom of God. Jesus was on assignment. And his assignment was to prepare the way of the king by reshaping the kingdom of God and the spirit of God in the earth realm. Verse number four says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them, not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Spirit not many days from now. He was getting them under to understand that there had to be not only a water baptism, but there had to be a spiritual baptism. That's right. Which means that there had to be a transformation in the spirit man that reconnected and resurfaces in the earth man. That's why we have this problem today in which we, we come to church and we have this Jesus sponsored by mentality. In which we come, but we're not really in the place. We're sitting in the right place, but we're looking in the wrong direction. You're preaching, but we're texting and we're doing all this other stuff. Because we have developed this mentality that I do God a favor by showing up. But you do not do God a favor by showing up. Mm -hmm. You do God a favor when you understand that worship is a lifestyle. Notice something very interesting. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, when will you at this time restore the kingdom? And he said to them, it's not for you to know my times or seasons, which is in the Father's own authority. Verse number seven says, it's not for you to know the times. Times refer to a chronological period of time. They were trying to literally get a landscape or a moment in which they could literally seize the opportunity so that they will know what to tell people when they see them. They wanted to know when they could exactly see when God would literally come back and redeem them with a political kingdom or a political authority. 
But what Jesus was trying to get them to understand was something greater than that. That the key is not just to some kind of religious or uh, uh, political authority, but the key is understanding that it is in my own timing. There is a timing of God that is not according to chronologically. It's a timing of God that comes from a kairos moment. It means a God-breathed period of time. It means a season of time in which you could have planned for one.